Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm filling in with Dr. for Dr. Tisher that couldn't be here today. I'm um, presenting a case of a 33-year-old female which had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass uh, and a known anastomotic ulcer and presented to the emergency room uh, with a massive upper GI bleed. <clears throat> so the first uh, step of the operation was to place a gastrotomy in order to evacuate the blood from the stomach. And then uh, we focused our attention uh, on the undersurface of the liver, which was uh, clearly uh, affected by the ulcer uh, in the gastric pouch. Um, the uh, stomach was then um, dissected out uh, in order to gain access to uh, the uh, lesser sac. Sure. And as you saw before, the NG tube was coming out of the enterotomy in the gastric remnant, uh, which uh, was diagnostic for a gastrogastric fistula. Uh, we then uh, continued our dissection. At this point, it was kind of clear that uh, the uh, gastric pouch would have needed to be resected uh, and that uh, the rule limb. Uh, um, you know, the, and the new gastrojejunal anastomosis would have needed to be done. So we dissected out uh, the rule limb further uh, in order to uh, create a new gastrojejunostomy. And over here you can see uh, the gastrogastric fistula, the NG tube, and the, um, and, and, you know, the, the size uh, of the ulcer that, uh, that this patient had. Um, so in order to, um, you know, resect the ulcer, uh, we then uh, flipped over the stomach and started our dissection uh, onto the lesser sac to free up the uh, gastric pouch uh, over there. Uh, and, you know, at this moment, uh, we, we proceeded with uh, blunt dissection. As you can see over there, there is a clot on the splenic artery. And we can stop the video right here. As soon as we started dissecting things out on the uh, splenic artery, as you can see, uh, brisk bleeding started to uh, come out of the uh, splenic vessels. All right, thank you, Dr. Filicori. Um, so if we can um, have the panel discuss what they've seen so far in the video, and as they're speaking, we can put the polling questions up, please. Great. Well, I'll try to tackle this first. So it looks like maybe the ulcer has eroded potentially into the splenic artery, and so that's what the clot is, and this is a little bit of a sentinel bleed. So in any vessel, you need to try to get proximal and distal control, um, which you could do laparoscopically if you are unable to do that. Um, which could have been with a distal pancreatectomy and a splenectomy, which is a little aggressive. I do think the IR embolization is a reasonable thing if you can't over so. I always like to get to some basics, so, you know, control with compression if possible, stop what you're doing for a minute, let anesthesia know that you've encountered a significant, potentially significant problem, make sure you have blood in the room, um, consider, you know, asking another, uh, another surgeon to come and join you, um, let the staff know that you might need to open. So I'm, I'm big on a, on a long pause if, and weigh every next step against how stable you are at that moment in time. I, I think that the best way to stop bleeding is to prevent it. Yeah. Then uh, the questions I would have is um, if uh, there was an interventional radiology procedure prior to this or an endoscopy. If um, the splenic artery was the source of the bleeding, probably with interventional radiology would have been able to be managed readily. Now that you are here, um, I agree with the measurements that uh, they were said about blood, anesthesia, et cetera, and local control. And then call your HPV surgeon to dissect the celiac trunk and ligate the uh, splenic artery. Yeah. Yeah, I, this, is a, this is a tough location for a bleed from the splenic artery. Um, and, um, I mean, you got to try to control this. And um, no one's mentioned the possibility of doing an open operation. Uh, so okay. if, you, uh, if you can't control this, um, that may be laparoscopically, that may be your next move. I'd be a little worried about referring for an embolization just because um, you know, you're going to have to, you have to control it, pack it, send the patient, that's going to take time. It might be possible to sew this. If you can maintain control, you could potentially um, under so the splenic artery uh, and, li and ligate that, but this is a really tough spot to try to get control, and it's difficult to, to locate it uh, shortly where it comes off of the um, celiac trunk. So um, I think I think you have to keep in mind the possibility for open. But if you can, if you can get control of it, and um, 
and put a stitch around it and control it, that, then that's, that's certainly another option. Do any of you have any concern about um, ligating this artery and possible misidentification of it and injury to any other part of the celiac trunk or um, ischemia to the spleen as a result of doing so? Well, I, I mean, you can, you know, if you ligate the splenic artery, um, you've, you've probably divided the short gastrics already potentially, but uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the spleen. I think the paddock artery would be the one to worry about. The left gastric, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, I would defer to the bariatric surgeon if that's altered anatomy, but um, I wouldn't worry too much about ligating the splenic artery there because you got to take care of the bleeding problem, and you can deal with the other downstream consequences later. The paddock artery would be the one that you don't want to injure. You should be okay. The spleen, the, the short gastric should actually be intact, so you can take out the main splenic artery and it'll be absolutely fine. I. I, you know, just out of controversy, I'm going to step it up a little bit of the way how I speak that normally I wouldn't do on a panel, but I'm going to say, come on, guys. If I'm doing a pancreas surgery and I find a hiatal hernia, even though I probably have done over 200 hiatal hernias, I'll call the gastric surgeon. This is an HPV issue where we are always around the celiac trunk. If you have an HPV surgeon that's capable to deal with this, do what Dr. Baisky has said, call for help. You just can put compression and call for help. Yeah. I, would, I would absolutely agree with that. Get somebody else in there to help you. It's a tough scenario. I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> Filippo, <laughs> let's go and see what was done. This, is like, this would be a very tough room on the board, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> tough room. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay, we can play the video now. And uh, as you can see, the bleeding uh, was uh, pretty brisk. And initially, uh, there was an attempt to control um, with pressure. Um, and then... Uh, we actually were able to control the bleeding uh, with some compression and uh, further dissected out uh, the uh, ruling in order to, uh, to sort of like prepare the field for us to uh, intervene on the bleeding uh, laparoscopically. Uh, at this point, uh, a second suction uh, was in, uh, inserted inside the abdomen uh, in order to uh, provide, uh, you know, a drier uh, surgical field. Uh, the first attempt uh, to uh, control the bleeding uh, at this point point uh, was done with uh, uh, clips, as you will see shortly. Uh, and so several clips uh, were deployed uh, on this uh, side branch of the splenic or uh, splenic artery. And uh, as you will see from the video, this initial attempt did not uh, really result in uh, um, control of the hemorrhage. So at, that, at this point, um, an attempt was made uh, with uh, uh, Ethibon uh, figure of eight stitches. Uh, which uh, the first one, as you, as you will see, was able to reduce the bleeding uh, enough <clears throat> to provide uh, some time for, um, some time for uh, you know, more clips to be placed and then uh, a second uh, ethibond uh, stitch, as you will see right now. Uh, during this whole time, anesthesia was alerted uh, and uh, uh, we caught up on resuscitation uh, and started administering blood. And this is the second stitch that goes onto the splenic artery, uh, which uh, finally provides um, hemostasis uh, on the artery itself. So at this point, once uh, hemostasis was obtained, uh, we're still uh, in a situation where we have to deal with this pretty massive ulcer uh, at the level of the gastric pouch and uh, the gastric remnant as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was uh, basically what to do uh, with the gastric pouch. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, we elected to uh, trim uh, the gastric pouch uh, to create uh, a fresh gastric jejunal anastomosis. And um, this was done with a linear stapler. And at the same time, uh, we divided further the stomach uh, remnant um, distally and uh, resected uh, the stomach remnant uh, at the level of the antrum. The ulcer base was once again checked and uh, appeared to be hemostatic at this point. Uh, sequential fires of the linear stapler uh, were uh, used in order to uh, resect the gastric antrum. And then a, uh, the rule limb was then the, uh, divided uh, to provide a fresh uh, small intestine to create a gastrojejunostomy. 
uh, the gas, the uh, rulin was then brought up to the uh, gastric remnant uh, and a um, uh, linear stapled anastomosis followed by uh, over sewing of the common uh, enterotomy was carried out uh, at this point. Um, the patient did well uh, and was uh, eventually discharged uh, on post of day two uh, after tolerating PO. Uh, there was no uh, further bleeding and uh, an endoscopy was done uh, to um, double check uh, the pattern and the, the caliber of the, gastro the gastrojejunostomy at the end of the case. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you for that. But. Um you know, the question is, so we could see the spleen in the video, and it still looks super viable, uh, but a lot of it was done fairly blindly, like not, it looked like it was very scarred in and inflamed, so it would have been difficult to isolate the splenic artery? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it was, you know, it, it seemed like there was some control, the control was achieved by pushing down on the splenic artery with the suction. And so at that point, once you have anesthesia catch up, I think, you know, giving it a first stab, uh, and uh, trying to control the hemorrhage laparoscopically was, was adequate. Um, although you need to always make sure that you have your open tray ready so that if the first attempt at controlling the hemorrhage like fails, you, you can quickly convert to an open procedure. And it's not fair because Filippo was not your case, but like <laughs> it looked like no drains and I like to throw a little holy water on stuff. So I'll get to seal or surge a cell on that. I would have put something on it, but Maybe I'm a nervous Nelly. Would any of you guys added anything to that? I don't know if that would really help you. I mean, bleeding, you're going to be able to tell from other reasons, and Tissiel is not going to stop a massive bleed either. No. Uh, uh, there's some advanced hemostatics that work amazingly well, like Everest and products like that. They're expensive, but, you know, sometimes they can, they can help in the situation. Um, yeah, you didn't mention, was this patient on NSAIDs or smoking because those are the two big risk factors or was this strictly due to the gastrogastric? Fistula? Yeah, no, I mean, that's an excellent point. Unfortunately, I was not involved in the care of the patient, um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if uh, that was the case. Well, I, I think um, anybody like this, it, it's absolutely important that the patient understands that they can never, never, you know, use NSAIDs ever in, in the future and uh, they shouldn't be smoking either because that's where a lot of these have their origin. Any thoughts on uh, going after the bleeding with clips initially versus sutures? I didn't like the clips because if you ended up needing to staple something later, they would interfere with a stapler, so I think that limits your future options. I think pressure in a suture is better for a first line. I think it's a very human response to fire some clips, especially when you can see a hole like you could see there, but there was a lot of anxiety on the, on the podium up here about putting clips on a vessel which wasn't necessarily identified. It's possible it was clearer in the room than it was the, the splenic artery, but we did have some concern that it might have been the hepatic or the um, left gastric. So, um, you know, ideally it gets dissected out and identified to... Um, both Dr. Pryor and Dr. Aspen's points. <laughs> I, it, it can also make it harder to get your sutures tied down smooth if you've got a clip sitting in there. And, and with a gastric bypass, if you devascularize the left gastric, it minimizes things since that's the only blood supply to your pouch. So, uh, you know, I think you have to be pretty cautious. Did you feel comfortable that that was indeed the absolutely sure the splenic artery? Yeah, no, I think those are all excellent points. I mean, it could have been the left gastric, it could have been the right hepatic. Um, I think that at that time, um, you know, they, they, they could see a small bleeding vessel, maybe a side branch of the splenic, and so it was reasonable to try and fire a couple of clips. I think that I probably would have done differently would have been to pick up the vessel with the Maryland, and that can sometimes, uh, you know, you can sometimes achieve better hemostasis by grasping the tissue instead of just fire, firing the hemoclip blindly onto the artery. The other modality that I think would be nice to use in this case is ICG and, and imaging. So after you've done your repair, you're all breathing better, your blood pressure's down. Um, get your imaging, make sure your perfusion looks good to everything that's left. We have been uh, attacking you, but I just have to also commend you for presenting this case. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, Dr. Filicori, thank you so much. Thank you. Um,